to TLCC 2019, the place where a virtual company and a global Tessitura community come together to share ideas and learn. It is great to be here with you in Chicago. To start, let's go back 120 years to Chicago in the year 1900. In 1900, the city of Chicago completed the reversal of the direction of a river. The Chicago River, which was flowing naturally into Lake Michigan, was directed instead to flow into the Mississippi River watershed. Why this change? Well, <laughs> Chicago smelled, and their water supply was threatened. One can only imagine what was flowing into the river in the days of uncontrolled factory waste, slaughterhouses, and other natural byproducts, if you will. What Chicago did was unprecedented and forward thinking, but it was a necessity. In 1887, the Illinois General Assembly decided to take this giant civil engineering step along with creating the most comprehensive sewage system in the United States. Thus, they disrupted the natural flow of an entire river to save a city. Without disrupting the river, the city that you can hopefully enjoy a bit while you're here at TLCC, maybe would have grown in an entirely different direction. Or maybe a completely different city in another location along the lake would have become the hub of commerce for this region. And shameless plug, you can take an enlightening and educational boat tour from Tessitura community members, Chicago Architecture Center, on that very same and much cleaner Chicago River. Disruption is a phenomenon that you can benefit from as a disruptor, or you can be run over and marginalized by being disrupted. And most of the time, we don't know that we're disrupted until something drastic happens. Actually, disruption is a consultant buzzword that was made popular in 1997 by Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen. In his groundbreaking book, The Innovator's Dilemma, he introduced the concept of disruptive innovation that explained how simpler or cheaper or unexpected companies can bring down and marginalize much bigger companies. And we have all seen and benefited from classical disruption firsthand. The hotel industry likely never anticipated that more rooms are on Airbnb than on the top five hotel brands combined. Airbnb has over four million properties listed. Marriott, with 5,700 hotels, has just over one million. Airbnb is a classic disruptor. They defined a new way to fulfill a need and create a desired service. And who would have thought I would be getting into strangers' cars to go wherever I want in almost any city I go to via Lyft and Uber, and I never have to fumble to pay? Certainly not the people who paid $1 million for a taxi medallion in New York City or the black cab drivers who studied to take a test called the Knowledge where they had to memorize 25,000 streets. But actually, I value the Lyft Uber frictionless experience, not just getting from point A to point B. And this is an important distinction in creating an experience versus just having a generic product. And we're gonna explore this more. Turns out, Christensen now admits, as do many others, that innovation and disruption are intertwined. And the word disruption has become an overused label. To sustain a business and grow takes a, an entirely different set of insights. And Christensen wrote another book, this, this one quite insightful, called Competing Against Luck. And he defines a framework for recognizing what it takes to deliver valued products and services. And actually, the concepts in, in the book focus on what consumers are interested in and what thus can drive growth. And he notes that products and services succeed not because of the features that they enable, but because of the experiences 
that they enable. And the goal is to create experience to, to fulfill consumer needs based on their functional, social, and emotional criteria. And that is where all of you come in. When you enable a valued experience for your customer, they will not view it as a generic event. They will view it as a desired solution rather than simply something they bought a ticket for. And they will pay often a premium price for that live experience. And the fact that recent new analysis suggests that many people spend more time streaming than spending quality time together is scary. People watch small screens at the times that they're choosing on the device that they choose from wherever they want, but attractive live experiences can get them up and out. So yes, entertainment patterns have truly been disrupted, and that includes arts and culture, what all of you bring to the world every day for them to enjoy. And there are social, emotional, contextual, and experiential aspects at play here. And all of you have the ability to create that growth, and all of you can give consumers meaningful experiences and memories that will last forever. We will hear about that firsthand from people in this room. There are 15 Tessitura-powered organizations within 26 miles of where I am right now. This is a vibrant arts and cultural community, and the visitor attractions in Chicago and the museums benefit those that live here and the many millions that visit. So I posed three questions to 10 leaders of those organizations. First, how are you disrupting your art form or your cultural purpose? Next, how are you reinventing yourself to be relevant in 2019 and 20 and beyond? And last, how are you innovating the art and attractions in your field, in your organization? So thank you to these great leaders for their insights. We will meet them shortly. My insight stories start with two iconic Chicago theaters. The ways that they have evolved and innovated have lessons for us all. Chicago Shakespeare you know, began as a, a theater company dedicated solely to a canon of 37 plays. Shakespeare would be more than our resident playwright. He would be our standard of theatrical excellence. And I think that he was a disruptor. And what he knew most importantly was how to engage an audience. And I think that in the performing arts, that is the most important thing, that the audience may well be the most important disruptor, that we must understand where they are at any given time and consider how we can best serve them. Out of limitation comes creativity, is the great mantra of every theater maker throughout history. We've disrupted forms of work, we've disrupted in terms of you know, creation of new types of theater constructs, new ways to partner with and engage in collaborative activities in our communities, new partnerships with schools. And while when you take it en masse, this three decade long history of this company, it seems like disruptions at the heart of our mission. I think the you know, part of what happens in an innovative culture is you never come up with a solution and then that's the answer forever, right? You're always thinking about, wait, how could we do that better? What could we do to make the front of house experience a little more in line with the artistic experience from a quality perspective? So I think that's a big piece of who Steppenwolf is and who we've been and who we always will be, uh, which is always trying to look to how do we respond to the changes in the cultural scene? How do we respond to the changes in our community? But how do we always do that in a way that is true to who Steppenwolf is? The insights continue with two very different types of Chicagoland theaters. The Harris Theater was founded just 15 years ago to support local art groups and artists. And the Writers Theater, up the road in the village of Glencoe, performed for 20 years in a 49-seat space in the anteroom of a bookstore, and they became recognized as one of the top regional theaters in the country and recently expanded. It is absolutely vital that the arts and cultural scene sector thinks about disrupting themselves. I think innovation and is key for us to keep growing and for us to keep moving forward. So for us at the Harris, it's really important to look at pieces of our business model that continue to support us 
help us to thrive, whether it's looking at the programmatic content, whether it's looking at how we engage with audiences, how we communicate what we have on our stage, why things that we do on stage and off are important and vital to the community. And by doing that and by asking ourselves those questions year over year really helps us stay ahead of the game. It's important to push the envelope. I think there are pieces that are so important that although they may be 400 years old, are still relevant. As administrators and as custodians of the arts, it's our responsibility to convey why those stories that are 400 years old still are relevant today. If we're not doing that, we need to question how we continue to operate. When I think about disruption, it's more about checking in and really understanding if you're still aligned. And then if you're not, going through a process to figure out what changes need to happen so that you can either realign your mission to the world or you can realign the actions that you're taking with your mission. But the, at the end of the day, we're still putting on plays. And so I think first and foremost, that is where the investment needs to be. But I am finding that people want to engage with the art much differently. They want to come to the theater a little early. They want to stay a little later. They want to have a sense of community and really talk about and engage with others about what they're experiencing as a group. And I think that's still very true to our art form where you're in a room with a bunch of strangers experiencing the same work on the stage at the same time. So these four theaters, totally different in their founding, are all striving to keep that founding spirit while evolving to change. I think there are four takeaways and lessons for us. First, always explore what's next and what's needed. Next, evolve for society, but evolve with society. And stay true to your core. Continually check with and test what you're doing against your mission. And of course, constantly consider what the total experience should be for your patrons. They are the ones that are making the time and financial commitment to walk through your doors. And while we might think that large, massive museums and attractions with giant fixed assets have limited capacity to innovate, my interviews revealed a far different story. When, like two million others per year, when I'm fortunate to visit the biggest visitor attraction in Chicago with my grandkids, the Shedd Aquarium, I benefit, my grandkids who live here benefit, from how they have innovated the business in their sector in many ways and become sector leading. And when tens of thousands per year get to take a Chicago Architecture Center boat tour, we are experiencing one of the many ways that they enable us to explore and learn about this great city. So let's hear from leaders of these two organizations. There are multiple ways that Shed thinks about disruption. I just think of it as standard business, that our audience changes, our city changes, the world changes. We have a vision of an aquatic world sustained by people who love, understand, and protect it. To do that, we have to constantly test and change and disrupt our way of thinking and our way of doing so that we can continue to move our work forward. We learned that our audience doesn't only experience things here at SHED. Our plan includes continuing to improve the experience here at SHED, but also thinks about how do we interact with our community there where they live as well as everywhere digitally. This year we piloted a Keep Shark Swimming campaign that used technology to help bring people into that research work. We're finding more and more that things like our extraordinary experiences, our brand new otter encounter sold out a whole summer's worth of spots in 15 minutes. They want that real experience. They want something that is different and tangible that they can talk about, that they can share pictures of. So we live in a real sweet spot for people. We live in the experience economy where people want to spend time. We have to use all of our tools in our toolkit. We have to make sure that we understand who's coming and make sure that they have the right story, the right offer at the right time. 
The Chicago Architecture Center has grown tremendously over the last couple of decades and we've had an opportunity with our architecture tours, especially our architecture river crews, to see a great increase in the amount of traffic coming through our place. We found a Mies van der Rohe building right opposite the river cruise that we're so famous for and we were able to take the base of the building and develop it as the Chicago Architecture Center. It's really transformed our business because now that we're a destination We've got multiple touch points that have really allowed us to broaden and deepen our engagement with our consumer. What's unique about the Chicago Architecture Center is that we're not your last stop destination, is that we see ourselves as a portal. So we especially designed it that we awaken people's curiosity about the city of architecture and they want to go out and see and touch the city and the neighborhoods and really expand their exploration. There are important takeaways from Megan and Len that have value. First, in some form or fashion, determine how we can take experiences to the community. Next, create multiple touch points to deepen engagement. And questioning, testing, innovating, and evolving our own work continuously is vital. Sometimes it's not just an individual organization that needs to change, entire sectors need radical change. Tessitura is proud to serve virtually all the major and mid-sized opera companies and orchestras and many small ones in the countries that we operate in. These are our art forms that are different in structure and financial models, but are similar in terms of stress and financial need. <laughs> many organizations in these sectors literally are underwater. They have high cost structures, the need to appeal to broader audiences, an imperative to create different types of experiences, and a mandate to be financially sound. And we have unfortunately seen bankruptcies, strikes, and much stress in these sectors. For these art forms, business as usual will mean no business will exist at all. One of my interviews serves as a proxy for the entire industry in terms of actions to remain solvent and to stay relevant. The Lyric Opera here in Chicago exemplifies many of the innovative operas in the Tessitura community in terms of their willingness to adapt in order to not only survive, but to thrive and succeed. They are the second largest opera in North America and have the enviable record of having had balanced budgets for 19 consecutive years. As a matter of fact, those of you that were privileged to be at TLCC 2015 in Orlando were able to see firsthand and hear from Renee Fleming firsthand how, sec how Second City is collaborating with the Lyric Opera. And that was only the beginning of their transformation. Let's hear more of their story. You couldn't ask me about disruption on a more appropriate day. Um, it's a concept that we at Lyric embrace and celebrate and relish. This evening here in our Opera House are the James Beard Awards, and you're asking right after the opening weekend of West Side Story, in which we had three sold out performances of this new co-production of this great musical playing over the weekend to over 10,000 people. We've already sold more than 75,000 tickets for the run of West Side Story and that was before the opening night. We believe that of that 75,000, 44, 45% are new to the building. And if our past experience is anything to go by, of the newcomers to the building, we should be able to persuade 20% to give opera a try for the first time. And you can be sure that we're communicating regularly and avidly with them to make it hard for them to refuse their first opera experience. I believe passionately in the validity and power of a large scale, great opera company um, maintaining and developing some of the greatest masterpieces of Western culture. But at the same time, I don't think any opera company or any performing arts organization can afford to be precious about their art form, can afford to be protective about simply maintaining tradition for tradition's sake. We have to be 
courageous, we have to be radical, and we have to understand what turns people on. And within the context of always wanting to produce great opera, we have to push boundaries and be inventive to ensure that the range of work that you do turns as many people on as possible, as frequently as possible. So what can we take away from Antony's remarks? Maximize the utilization of the assets that we have, such as the Lyric did for the James Beard Awards and many other events. Extend our art forms in ways that will reach more people. Create new kinds of experiences. Collaborate in both traditional and unexpected ways. And use data to determine trends and patterns and smartly target and engage people that visit. Expand your entertainment share of wallet. You sell admissions and tickets to meaningful moments. You are the closest to the pulse of what it takes to create memories. And you are the ones that are at the forefront of helping people live their lives with wonderful experiences, both within your four walls and within their communities. Conventional wisdom is that streaming media and small screen addiction could obsolete the arts. Well, the Tessitura community is proving that is not the case. I heard great examples of your experiences in all my interviews, and I'm pleased to share a few highlights with you here. We have such a spectacular setting. We have great music that we're putting on our stage. We have this beautiful skyline that surrounds the Pritzker Pavilion in Millennium Park. You can't get that kind of experience on a screen. When we think about live theater, I think that it's important to think about what differentiates us from where the world is going and our use of devices. For me, that's about what is really special about a theatrical experience, and it's about building empathy. It's a way to sit with other people to see a work of art that's only going to be performed specifically that way for you that night. We really have to key in on that empathic experience and the ability to step into somebody else's shoes. I believe when I sit in an, in an audience chamber in one of our three theaters that there is magic in the air. And part of the magic is the dynamic and real-time creation of and engagement in art. And so I feel like our job is to vouchsafe that for the generations to come. How do we ensure that we are relevant in today's day and age with you know, everybody's attention on their phones, for instance? Someone once said to me that performing arts organizations are the emergency response centers for the soul. And you know, if you think about that, that will always be true. There won't be a moment in which what we do isn't relevant. We will always be the emergency response centers for the soul. But what we have to do is figure out ways to communicate that to the people who need it the most, the people whose souls need emergency response. There are powerful insights here. Create memorable and magical experiences. Have and build empathy with your audiences and for your audiences and enable engagement, not just attendance. So I go back to where I started. Think about your own organization. The Chicago River was reversed by design in 1900. Are you creating new tributaries for new experiences? And Tessitura is into analytics with many sessions here at the conference. So let's think about two metrics and two questions. First, how much are you doing to innovate your business to stay relevant? On this scale, where are you? And next, how are you at making your experiences really meaningful? And what can you do? Think about it. So these are questions to consider as you spend time here at TLCC, 300 sessions to choose from, and 2,000 of your peers to share ideas and insights with. 
The time to prepare for the future is right now. After all, you are the emergency response centers for the soul. The Tessitura Network is proud to serve you and pilot this journey with you. Have a great conference, gain insights, go home to benefit your organizations, your communities, and the souls of the world. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.